uh, I've seen stoneflies on lakes, you know, they'll fly and get lost and or the wind carries them or they, again, they've hatched in a stream and have got themselves out into the lake and, and trout, they're not sitting underneath the water with a, one of Rick's books going, wait a minute, that's a golden stone, you're not supposed to be here. And they just look at that and go, wow, look at that hamburger, I'm going for that. Right? So you will see some of those uh, in those situations, you will see, you know, that, that little stream or river coming in as a little conveyor belt of food and oxygen. Phil Roy is back for a bonus round, dry fly, still water style, today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Togan's Fly Shop providing superior quality products at a very affordable price. A great resource for tying materials, tying tools, and lots of fishing accessories. Since 2005, Togans has been delivering on price, service, and passion. And now I want you to check out Togans for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans to get started right now. That's T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans. Togans online. Check it out right now. Phil Roy, the man, the myth, the legend, is back for another Stillwater Round. And this one is good. Phil takes us to the lake with a focus on surface bugs for trout. He gets into his favorite uh, retrieves, some entomology, a little bit of everything, including his top fly patterns for each of the hatches, all dries, all on the surface. This is a fun one. I tried really hard to keep this one short as a mini bonus, but it was too good to cut short. So you're gonna get you're gonna get almost a full length episode today. Without further ado, here he is again, Phil Rowley. How's it going, Phil? It's going well. How about yourself? Not too bad. We are uh, we are getting ready. When this goes live, we're going to be getting pretty close to uh, wrapping up the end of the giveaway we have going. So we're going to dig into that a little bit and a couple of tips and tricks like we always do. And this is actually, I think you are officially, you've been on this podcast more than anybody else. So this is, uh, <laughs> we're celebrating that. I am your uh, little cork when things have a hole in it. You need a plug. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Everybody's yeah. got to have a purpose. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you're you know, you're the uh, you are still water guru. So uh, that's one of my favorite words. I love the word guru. So we're going to use that today. All um, right. Um, but I want to talk about we're we're going to be doing this uh, this trip here in in June, and I want to check in with you on you know just a couple of kind of high level questions I was thinking about sure. and that come to my mind. And let's just start with the the thing I kept thinking about was um, kind of surface action, right? And and that's something for me in my experience still water. I haven't done a lot of that. Can you talk just quickly about maybe in general, you know, what that looks like? Is that something where you, you get into it and you're doing it all day or more like occasionally you might see a random hatch out there? It can be a combination of both. Um, you know, still waters in general aren't, you know, in my experiences across North America is you don't get the dry fly opportunities that uh, you would see on rivers and streams. Um, you know, particularly in productive lakes, trout, it's safer to feed deeper um there's more food down there the food is all near the bottom amongst the weeds and those kind of things so it's just safe and efficient to feed down there but there are special times and obviously when a a hatch is emerging that is enough food sources up on the surface that are perhaps not hatching quickly um, or they're large like a big caddis we do get some large caddis flies in lakes Uh, we call them traveler sedge or some people might know them as a motorboat caddis where they're you know like a size eight two, three X long or even bigger. So they're kind of the still water equivalent to a, maybe a golden stone uh, for those familiar with that Mm -hmm. food source in rivers. So that'll bring fish up, but there are also certain places like Skitchin um, that are home to wild native fish. These fish have, are not, um, you know, stocked like uh, some of the lower elevation lakes. So they have evolved to be more surface orientated. So you can obviously get them when there's a hatch coming on, whether that's, you know, emerging or egg-laying coronamids, um, calabatus mayflies, caddis, some terrestrials. Uh, In the fall months and early spring, we can get water boatmen and back swimmer activity. So those fish will come up, obviously, for those food sources. But because of just the way they've evolved and, uh, you know, perhaps some of these lakes at the higher elevations are not as productive as the lower elevation lakes. Um, These fish have evolved to, you know, 
search a little bit more and take advantage of whatever they see. So you will get fish that are um, will come up even when there's no hatch on. They will just be surface orientated. They might be cruising um, eight to ten feet down and just see something on the surface and come up for a look. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty special that way to be able to do that. And you could do it all day long if you wanted to, hmm. or um, you'll see some surface activity and enough of it in an area or um, that says, okay, I'm going to give this a try. It's not just a, a lone rise. It might be half a dozen fish or more that are constantly up on the surface. It's, gotcha. always, it's always worth to make a toss at them. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's it. So basically not too much different than fish in rivers where you, no. yeah, you had a good hatch coming off and you're like, well, something's going on. I'm going to try to match this hatch. And you mentioned a few kind of chronomids, calabatus and caddis. Yeah. So matching the hatch. So what does that look like? So the hatch is coming off somewhere. I mean, how are you, right? You got all these different sizes. How do you know? Mm-hmm. Do you have just a selection of flies in your box? You kind of have an idea what's going to potentially happening. Yeah, you always, obviously, you want to be prepared with some uh, cross-section of flies. But I think one of the most important thing with any surface activity on rivers or lakes is to, you know, suppress your excitement a little bit because we always get, oh, wow, fish are rising. Let's, you know, start, just go at them. Um, you need to really stop, and particularly with lakes, is, is watch the rise form. Um, look for signs because when you watch the rise form, fish take different um, stages differently. Um too many difference there but (laughs) um so you want to watch the rise form so a fish that takes something on the surface typically you'll see their nose poke out of the water um you might you'll see their it's kind of this head tail rise you'll see their tail sweep through the rise and a little bow wave which when you know between the tail sweep and the bow wave caused by the just behind their head gives you clues to their speed and direction so you can anticipate where to place your next cast because a lot of times the rise is where the fish was you need to find out where it's going so that helps um the other thing when a fish takes something off the surface a lot of times they'll come up they open their mouth they grasp it and of course they take a gulp of air within that process and they expel the air because it's not food and that leaves a little telltale bubble right in the middle of the rise form so those are clues Mm. okay fish is taking an adult most of the times, though, however, trout being opportunistic, like to feed, if there's a hatch on, on the emerger stage, right? So that mm-hmm. is the nymph or the pupa as it's just below the surface or perhaps suspended in the surface film um, in, the mo- in, a, in transition. So, you know, from a predator-prey perspective, that bug is helpless. It's, you know, it's totally committed to transforming into the adult stage. I think it offers a larger profile because it's kind of crawling out of its nymph or pupal shuck. And starting to transition into the adult and pulling out, so it's you know maybe half or three quarters as big as it was in its nymph or pupil stage, so it's an easier target, and it's just easier to feed. So um, you'll see a, a fish rise like that is more of a head and shoulders or a porpoising rise, where you it's just a delicate, not really, not always delicate, but you know you just see the from behind the head to the dorsal fin. So that's a clue they're probably fishing something just at or below the surface. So as opposed to that dry fly, you know, that sur- the adult rise where you're going to, you know, perhaps in the, st- let's choose calabatus. So instead, yeah, you know, if they're taking duns on the surface, you're going to be using a mayfly dun pattern, like, uh, you know, a parachute Adams is a mm. really good pattern. Um, I've got one, I call my version of the F fly. It's uh, CDC. Um, you know, there's lots of good mayfly patterns out there. It can certainly be customized into a calabatus imitation. But if they're feeding on the nymphs, you might fish a soft tackle. You might fish uh, an unweighted nymph just below the surface. Um, you might fish a, a nymph with a foam back or maybe a wing case that's designed to maybe on a scud hook like a quiggly or a cripple kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, that will just suspend in or just below the surface to take advantage of that. So that's really the most important thing is to have a good long look and make sure you're using what they're feeding on. Like up at Skitcheen, yeah. uh, one of the uh, favorite patterns up there is Randall Kaufman's Timberline Emerger, a simple mm. fly that's basically a, a nymph. Look, you know, it's got, I believe it's got like a gray dubbed body, um, hackle tail and a little um, um, collar, and then two grizzly hackle tips uh, tied on top for the wing, kind of swept back. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just sits, you just fish that right in, in the surface film. Um, cast of those rising fish. And you can also, soft tackles work well because you can 
you know, fish with a floating line or perhaps a midge tip that just gets that tip section underneath very subtly and just retrieve those flies very slowly back through the pods of rising fish. And you can take a lot of fish that way because um, you're covering water and sometimes that movement makes your fly stand out a bunch all those naturals that maybe aren't moving, yours moves and, and trout being primarily a sight feeder, you'll see that movement and come over, investigate and hopefully eat your fly. That's amazing. So retrieve. So, and you're talking about the timber, what was it? The, the timber line or the timber line emerger. There's a yeah, timber line. fly up there. And that's kind of imitating that calabatus as well. Yeah, it was originally designed for that. So it sits just beneath the surface. You could probably add a little bit of floating to it just to slow it, sink rate a little bit and trap a few air bubbles in there, which is always good. Um, but the English are very adept at, at fishing dries. And if you look at an English style dry fly, they're not sort of the typical dry flies you'd see on rivers and streams. They're, they're damp. They're, they're almost like a, a wet fly, but tied with a low grade, um, uh, Indian neck or cock hackle. Um, so it'll slow the sink rate of it, but it sits right in the surface film or slightly below, um, as opposed to sitting right up on the surface film, like an adult and they can be deadly effective. Nice. Okay. So that gives us uh, definitely, and I love that the stripping. So basically some fish are rising and you cast out your emerger and you just slowly do it. I get, you probably change it up, but you kind of strip it through. What, what sort of retrieves are you looking like there? Usually I use a very slow figure of eight. Um, the figure of eight is just a, a backbone cornerstone still water retrieve because it's so versatile. But a lot of times we don't want to move the fly too fast. Uh, particularly you often get some of your best rising activity when the water is calm because that surface film I believe is a little more of a barrier for that insect to break through um, there's no um, wind action or a ripple you know sort of breaking it up and making it easier to climb through I remember reading years ago you know the equivalent uh, an insect emerging is the equivalent of you and I trying to dig through six feet of dirt oh wow I don't know who does these analogies like but it sounds <laughs> you know you know, when the, when the surface is calm and, you know, the surface tension is, is probably a, a reasonable barrier to, for those insects to work their way through, you know, and you do get those stillborns and cripples that just mm -hmm. can't exhaust them or they become entangled in their um, trying to get out of their, you know, their pupil or nymphal shuck and get tangled up that way as well. So that little bit of movement, the hand twist is good because it's, you still want to go slow and the hand twist is what I call a busy retrieve because you're moving your hands in your mind a fair bit, but the fly isn't moving that much and it's kind of erratic. So it keeps your, if you're an impatient person, it co sort of keeps you at bay because you don't want to strip too fast because if you are using a floating line on a calm surface, there's always a risk you're going to create surface disturbance uh, by that line moving across right. ripples, which could alert the fish. So we tend to fish longer leaders, you know, um, uh -huh. maybe you know, nine feet would probably be short, 12 would be average, and 14 is about about as long as you want to get. Because after you get longer than 14, um, there's a risk of you losing accuracy because that skinny tippet at the end of the leader, the fly can fall left or right of the target, um, which may or may not be bad some days. But if you're trying to hit a specific rising fish, you want to be able to do that. And, you know, a, a leader about 12 feet long will, will enable you to get the separation between your fly and your fly line, but yet still mm -hmm. be able to accurately cover a moving fish. Perfect. And that 12 foot leader, is that just your standard? Would you be using the same leader if you're fishing like chronomids down under an indicator? No, I tend to use, you know, a simple way for people to do it would be just like a seven and a half foot tapered leader, uh, maybe a nine, and then add your tippet on top of that. Right. Yeah. So the leader has a little bit of backbone. Um, so it's, you know, I always look at leaders have to a help you catch fish and B be castable, right. If they're constantly tangling up, um, yeah. and it's frustrating. Um, you can certainly use level leaders. Um, but, uh, if you're new to fly fishing lakes or just new to casting longer leaders, a level leader, meaning it's all made out of the same material. Um, it, it can be a little, um, tangle prone if you're, if you're careful. So it just helps you out that way. There's nothing wrong with a level leader, but I generally start with that seven and a half footer. That gives me about three or four feet of butt section that'll help turn everything over. And then I can just add and subtract, um, tip it as, um, you know, conditions require. Generally you want to fish a shorter leader as you can, just cause it's easier to cast. Um, but there are going to be those clear calm days that you may have to extend it to 12 or 14, as I said. Mm -hmm. So um, you've got to, um, take it, you've got to be able to do that. So it gives you the versatility to, to do that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good tip. Well, uh, let me get back into, you mentioned the flies and this is interesting because you got the dries and the emergers and you've also got a bunch of everything under the surface further. Mm -hmm. 
which we've dug into on past episodes. Uh, I'll kind of put in the show notes, but uh, way back to episode 34, we had you on episode 267 <laughs> oh, and, wow. and episode 307, which was just last uh, week or when we did our kind of the Skitching kickoff. Yep. And, uh, and so there's a bunch of information there. Plus, obviously, you have the probably the uh, I guess people, some people have called it the, the, the new Stillwater Bible out there. What's the name of your Orvis uh, book? Oh, the Orvis Guide is um, Stillwater Trout Fishing. So, yeah, I have a whole section, a whole section, a whole chapter on, um, you know, fishing to surface re- feeding fish, oh, surface wow. feeding tactics. So a lot of what I've talked about, reading the rise, emerger tactics, and what often comes when you're fishing uh, on the surface, particularly in Clear Lakes, is a chance to sight fish, too. So we also cover... Um, you know, how to deal with a sighted fish and, and how to anticipate its um, movement, what to look for, how to spot fish, and then how to read fish because fish will cruise at different rates. Like if you see one that's, you know, scooting along at a quick pace and, and it always reminds me of the rabbit out of Alice in Wonderland, right? I'm late, I'm late. Um, that fish yeah. is like it's on the way to somewhere. That fish is probably not catchable. It's spooked. It's it's a But then you see that late, the next fish comes in as kind of a lazy cruiser moving a little bit left, a little bit right, you know, it looks like it's feeding and that's, it looks relaxed and that's a fish, you know, you make a decent presentation to, you should be able to coax that. And then you get groups of fish, particularly young fish. They all, they all hang out. Trout and lakes tend to hand out, hang out in age class. So, you know, as they get older, there's less of the class left. Um, so that's why those larger solitary fish are harder to catch. But when you get smaller fish, um, but still obviously catchable and a lot of fun cruising in a group together, a pod. Um, you, those are often catchable because they, they're like siblings. They get competitive with each other. So if something lands by one, the others all want it, even though they don't <laughs> know what it is, right? And those fish you can usually get as well. So lo- lots of those kind of tips are in that chapter and, of course, the book itself. In the book, yeah, that, that's pretty good. It sounds like you have a – yeah, I mean, it sounds like the obviously you spent a lot of time on Stillwater. It's really yeah. interesting to hear. I mean, I haven't thought about some of these, you know, the, the ideas you've mentioned here. So now, are you talking? So when you just, are you pretty much seeing these fish? Is that kind of the way? When um, you're, so, yeah. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you only see the rise form. Sometimes you've been in a, an area of the lake that you've seen surface activity, so you just sort of fish it blind. So the beauty of fishing dry flies on lakes is we're not just casting that dry fly out and then sitting down and waiting like you would perhaps indicator fishing where you might leave something in a, in a location. Typically you're shotgunning an area. So in fan casting, so you you set up on this area, you would um, fan cast around. So if the stern of the boat is, or to the left side of your pontoon boat or float tube is nine o'clock and the right side is three, you're going to try and spray your casts around on every hour and just let it sit and typically, you know, once that fly sits for, let's say, 10, 20 seconds, if nothing happens, pick it up and put it somewhere else. Because it's usually that splat of it landing on the surface that might call a fish over because they use their lateral line as well, right? So a, their lateral line that runs along the side of the fish is, is a, a series of pores um, that, you know, records v- vibration and disturbance in the water and, and sends those impulses up to the brain that either interprets it as food or you know, fight or flight, right? Um, and if it sounds like food, that'll turn a trout. They go, okay, I picked that up on my sonar, if you will. And I'm going to come over and have a look at it. So a lot of times we're just, you know, you're always casting, lay it down, nothing happens, just a gentle pickup, place it somewhere else and see if you can call fish up that way as well. So you're just not, you know, k- pitching it out there and then just sitting for all eternity, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty that's... That's pretty boring. And that would be. That would be. You yeah, know, that... People often criticize fly fishing in lakes as boring. And right. my answer to that is the cure for boredom is move the fly. So either retrieve it or pick it up and cast it somewhere else. Because with every retrieve or every new placement of the fly, it, I think it engages you and, and gets you focused. Because if you're bored and not paying attention, uh, Murphy's Law will say something will happen and you won't be ready for it. And That's you'll miss right. the opportunity. That's right. right. You'll yeah, be, exactly. you know, with an indicator fishing, you're looking down at something in your boat, you look up and your indicator is gone. And rather than react to it, we just tend to lean in and stare harder at it going, where's my indicator gone? And then it pops back up and the opportunity's and lost. You lost it. Yeah. You lost it. Oh man, there you go. <laughs> this, this is good. So I, as you were talking, I was just thinking about, you know, I'm at IFTD this week and, um, 
off before we got started, we were talking about products. And there is one that I was just thinking about. I talked to the guys at Outcast, and they have a new, I think it's a new float tube. It only weighs like seven pounds. Yep. Yeah, yeah so. I, I work with the uh, the folks at Outcast, and Chris, and yeah, that's what I talked to Chris. Yep, Alex, and who else was there? Was Kellen there? Uh, you know what? I just saw Chris. I didn't talk just to Chris, him, but yeah. yeah, yeah, good, really good people, mm-hmm. and good person. Yeah, so you know about that. So that's yep. cool. And I haven't done a lot of float tubing in, in a little while, but that would be the two, man. I could see that throw that seven pounds in your backpack, and then. Yep. That's that was always the bummer. I remember when I used to do the backpack, it was like my pack weighed like a hundred pounds, so I used to kill myself. Yeah, it's it's fun for the first, I don't know, twenty feet. After that. <laughs> Man, I need to slim this thing down. They've also yeah. got float tubes now with oars on them. Oh wow. So if you um you know, a lot of you know, kicking and paddling around is okay, but if you get on big water or sometimes the wind comes up and now you're you know, mm-hmm. maybe at the end of the day and a That's little right. tired, now you can just engage the oars and and kick and paddle or just paddle and um with the oars and and, and that's great too so that's, that's a sweet. Pretty neat in, innovation you know, on their cruiser and i believe on their they've added it to their um fat cat series of pontoon oh, the fat cat, yeah. don't quote me on my product knowledge there but i yeah yeah no that is a great tip i've done that plenty of times with the tube where you you take your time fishing half the day and, and you're slowly work yourself to the other side of the lake and then the wind picks up mid-afternoon yeah. It's kind of like river fishing, right? You always seem to walk downstream, at least I do. And then at the end of the day, you're like, oh man, now I got to slug up against all that current and, and, you know, cross the river here and there. And I'm just, I was fine when I started my trek back to the vehicle, but I'm exhausted. Why don't I just walk upstream when I have, um, energy and of course, arguably a better presentation, right? Maybe. Um, and, uh, then I'm walking downstream on the way home. I've got you know, current pushing me home. So I do do that on lakes. I do actually factor the wind in sometimes. Mm. You made a good point. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is some wind, I might early in the day, I'm going to, when I'm full of energy and enthusiasm and all that stuff, um, fish upwind. Mm. And then at the end of the day, you know, do it more so in boats. If you're using an electric motor or something, if if something happens mechanically doesn't work, you're going to be blown back, right? As opposed to now I'm no power and I'm getting further away every second. So, well, it's interesting. We, and again, I'm just thinking things are popping in my head, but I remember we had a day like that. I was with my dad and we were in the, um, we were in the drift boat and, uh, we were going across a lake, uh, and it was a big lake and it was the same thing. We, you know, we, we kind of fished our way over and then we got over and the wind came up and we were just, I was rowing against the wind and it was, it was raging. Yeah. Luckily I had at least a drift boat and, but and I just threw my line out there, had my dad with the rod. I think we threw up like a, you know, a woolly bugger or something, just yeah. let it, let the line go out there. And we landed a huge, huge rainbow. And just, I mean, there were literally white caps out there. So, I mean, you can still catch fish when it's kind of crazy like that. Oh yeah. A lot of times the fishing can be really good because, um, it breaks up the surface, the, diffuses the light. The fish feel a little more protected, a little more confident in their feeding behavior. It churns up food, um, you know, and, and, and trout like, you know, trout and lakes are river and stream fish at heart. It's in their DNA to swim in any current. So it'll help channel the movement of the fish too, right? You know, if you see a fish rise and there's a little bit of breeze, my first inclination, if I'm going to cover that fish and I didn't get any real clues as to which direction it was going, I'm going to cast upwind of that fish because that's where I anticipate it would go, right? Swimming into that current. Yeah. That wind induced current. Trestle is a leading company designing, engineering, and manufacturing industry leading outdoor products. The CRC system from Trestle provides secure, convenient storage for your fully rigged fly rods. Every CRC system comes with secure mounting clamps and padding in the reel compartment. You can leave your gear on your vehicle full time or quickly take it off and telescope it down into carry mode in just a few minutes. I actually connected with John in person for the first time at a recent event uh, in Salt Lake and it was really cool to chat with John and see the products in person. They've got a new product that uh, is in their line that's out there. You can check out right now if you head over to Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. They're all about making things easier, faster, and helping you get on the water uh, quicker from their CRC system to their new bike system that you're going to have to check out right now. I'm definitely going to be riding and using this thing. Uh, Forget about the wagon this year. It's all about this bike carrier for me, so can't wait to dig into this and for you to check it out for yourself. 
they've got a lot of good stuff uh, and a good story. So if you haven't checked out uh, Trestle, we've got an episode coming up with John to tell the story. So stay tuned for that. But right now, head over to Trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E right now and click over to check out Trestle. Go do it. No, this is interesting. And I, as we're talking here, I'm thinking, you know, the, and I want to get back to it, just wrap this thing sure. up with some fly patterns, but, um, you know, just on the still water, like fishing, I was talking to, to, uh, Greg about this and it, it's like, well, up there, you guys are in the Mecca, right? Kamloops and the whole area in Canada. But I mean, it's really, I've always loved still water fishing, but for somebody who maybe hasn't done much of it or any of it, what is the pitch to them? Like, why would somebody, you know, there's the first question, why would they want to do it? And the second question would be, do you find that a lot of people get into still water first or is it more like they fish rivers and then get into still water? I would say probably rivers to lakes. Mm -hmm. Um, that was how I started. I actually, you know, my first, uh, forays were always river. Um, but in British Columbia where I lived for 36, 37 years, um, the lakes were just more accessible and and there's a rich culture of still water fishing, but you know, in other States and provinces, that's not always the case, but, um, you know, so probably more that evolution from rivers to, to lakes, particularly as we get older and lazier. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to be, you know, crawling over log jams and around big boulders and wading up to our armpits and all that stuff. Um, you know, the lakes are, you know, generally a little more serene. You're sitting down in a float tube mm-hmm. or a boat, letting the, the wind or the motor move you around. But some of my arguments for lakes, and it's funny, that's the first chapter in my book is why lakes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and is literally, you know, um, in no particular order, um, typically a longer season oh. because many rivers and streams are closed, um, you know, to protect spawning fish and things like that. So they have limited seasons where many lakes are open 365 days a year. Um, you, I always joke our bugs are bigger. Um, <laughs> we, we usually don't have to deal with trichos and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, micro betas and things right. like that. And, and our midges, our coronamids are typically, you know, in some lakes they're eight, two XL or bigger. Um, but you know, generally larger size, we're not dealing with twenties and 22s and 24s and all that stuff that are mm-hmm. common to some tailwater fisheries. Um, there's, if you like matching the hatch, as we've talked about here, there is a plethora of bugs to keep you occupied. Scuds, leeches, dragonflies, damselflies, coronamids, multiple colors in there, mayflies, caddis, water boatmen, terrestrials, baitfish, leeches. Um, it just goes on and on. Um, less crowds generally. Um, you know, rivers still get a lot of attention. Um, so they can be pretty crowded places where lakes can be a little more remote or even if they're crowded. Um, you're not all fighting for the similar water. You can hmm. um, usually find a, a place. Um, what else is there? I just yeah, those are huge. The pace is le- you know, less, less effort is required. There's no right. like long walks through, um, unless you want to, but generally, you know, you launch at the boat launch and off you go. You're, you're fishing almost immediately. There's no two mile, two mile trek downstream right. um, to get to the good water. Um, uh, yeah. So man, many, many reasons. Yeah, you got me sold. That's that. Those are, the, <laughs> and the uh, the the old factor is great because I mean, like you, you know, you could be an old man and be still out there on the still water, right? Well, I, and I see that a lot with with schools and guiding is and talking to them is they're just like, you know what, I I just don't have that youthful energy anymore. The ability, you know, they may mm-hmm. have a physical physical impediment. Um, you know, over life we all get older, unfortunately, or we ha- suffer an injury, and and at least you can still um, get out there and fish, right? Whereas, um, you know, that's not always the case on rivers. Probably the last thing I always joke about too is our fish tend to be bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, talk to some river friends; they tend to measure their fish in inches. We get to measure them in pounds. So, right, uh, you know, with our productive lakes, where you're getting, you know, fish. You know, you go down to those trips I do to Argentina, we're getting fish to 20, 22 pounds. And they're talk right. there's a 30 pound rainbow swimming around in there. I'm not sure I, I'd like to get a hold of that, but I'd also, <laughs> um, it kind of intimidates you a little bit because that's one monster rainbow. You might be worried, like fishing for sharks. <laughs> like, why yeah. am I, waiting? why am I in the water with them? <laughs> <laughs> that's massive. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's wrap it up here with the, uh, just a couple more of those flies. So you mentioned the calabatus, you've got mm-hmm. the, so give us, if you're talking dry flies, what would yep. be for chronomids? Is there a pattern that you might use? Yeah, there is um, a couple of patterns. My good friend Brian Chan's got one called the Lady McConnell, um, named after McConnell Lake up near uh, Mm -hmm. Campbell's. 
Um, um, there's one on my YouTube channel that was invented, created by Paul Lasha. I have real faith in called the raccoon. Um, mm-hmm. it just looks like an emerging coronamid. Um, I've got one in my, one of my books called the Willy. Um, it's just a, a, a low riding dry fly. You know, mm-hmm. we don't need our flies to sitting up proud on hackle. Usually they sit flush right on the surface because there's just no surface current to make the insect have the requirement to sort of stand up a little bit. They'll All right. Sit. So those would be, um, and there's a couple of good English ones. Um, there's a shuttlecock. Um, I've got one on my first book called the parapupa because a lot of times with coronamids in particular, they could be taking the pupa as they hang at the surface, which is like a comma. They could take it in a transitional state where it's emerging, and then they could take the adult when it sits on the surface. Too. Oh wow! That goes back to our rise form discussion again. So you could use the same pattern for multiple uh, kind of types. You can, or you can have multiple patterns for different. Uh, emergence, beha- different surface feeding behaviors, whether they're taking emergers, uh, whether they're taking the pupa just as they suspend beneath the surface prior to hatching, and then the adult as itself. Because the adults, there's two opportunities with coronamids. There's obviously the hatching part, but the females uh, return to the water, typically low light hours of morning and evening when the winds are reduced and the chance of being picked off by a, another predator like a bird or a dragonfly or something is less, and they'll lay their eggs. So they'll sit on the surface or they'll scurry along the surface and break the surface tension and then drop the tip of their abdomens in there and they'll drop the eggs into the water. Um, so that sort of scurrying activity creates wake and, of course, attracts attention from fish. So those would be sort of coronamid patterns I'd have. And is the clink hammer, is that style of fly, is that something that would, yeah, yeah. Yeah, would work very well? My parapupa is basically, a before I ever heard of the clink hammer, it's just a on a curved hook with the – um, you know, the hook part of it mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, dressed to look like the pupa. And then you've got a wing post and a parachute hackle and the wing post is so you can see it. I usually make it of high vis so I can see it at a distance. And that's just designed to suspend that, the actual fly underneath the surface, like a pupa just suspending, uh, right at the surface before transforming into the adult. Perfect. And uh, give us a couple on uh, like uh, caddis and we'll do terrestrial. Sure. So what would it be a couple dry flies for caddis? Uh, for caddis would be this one called the Michelux sedge. I love that fly. Um, it's a tri-winged. It's it's um, elk hair or deer hair tri- t- tied for a tail and then in three clumps up the body. It's um, um, you know larger fly. It floats well, and when you strip it, it'll scoot because caddis love to scurry. Um, the tom thumb is mm. a famous Pacific Northwest. British Columbia pattern that's just deer hair tail, deer hair body, deer hair shell back, deer hair wing all <laughs> tied in, um, but looks like a transitioning caddis. You know, the tail represents the shuck, the body is the body of the insect, and when caddis first emerge, they often stick their wings vertically to dry them for a mm-hmm. second before tucking them along their back and going for a scoot. An elk hair <laughs> caddis will work, um, so those are some yep. good ones. Um, terrestrials, you know, uh, bionic ants, any Chernobyls. Uh, you know, sometimes in in May, we'll get some carpenter ants come out. Those big, I always joke, those are the ones you crunch when you step accidentally. Oh, yeah. Or if you look closely, you can see the little tool belt they've got on them because they're a carpenter ant. Oh. Um, they're big, <laughs> so um, they'll get on those. Um, you know, Kelly Gallup's got his antacid. I like that little fly. Okay. Um, he's also got a good caddis pattern I like for smaller caddis called a butch caddis. Oh, yeah. Um, that works well. Um, and then mayflies, um, your parachute atoms is an excellent still water pattern, um, because you can dress that to sit lower in the water, only dress the wing post and it's more emerger like, or you dress the whole body and it'll sit, you know, at, by dressing, I mean, putting floating on it, it will, um, sit a little higher up and maybe represent an adult. I've got one on my, on my YouTube channel called the, uh, Calabatus F fly. Um, yeah, there's a number of good, and then we talked about the timberline emerger, of course, mm-hmm. Um, you could dress a clink hammer to be a calabatus and Quigley's cripple. I like too that kind of, um, gangly, you know, half, half nymph, half adult, um, looking fly also works well. There you go. This is awesome. So that gives us a, a good selection. And, and since I'm not going to be, uh, probably tying too many flies, where, where would you recommend, uh, I go to pick some of these flies up? Um, some of those flies I mentioned, you can get from mine and Brian's online Stillwater fly fishing store, just oh, cool. stillwaterflyfishingstore.com. It is a, an online store we designed to cater to the weird and specific needs of the Stillwater fly fisher, um, that is not readily found in a lot of times because, 
um, you know, f- fly shops. If they're if you're sitting on the banks of the Missouri River in Montana, I would be focused on what's in the Missouri River in Montana yep. and not what's in Henry's Lake. That's you know four or five hours away. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. And uh, and I was and you're talking about you know we're kind of doing talking a little entomology here, but you had uh, you did a little s- segment with Rick Hayfley recently. Was that? Yep. Uh, I mean, I've we had him on a while back talking about rivers, but how was that little uh, session? Oh, that was fun. Rick and I go, uh, Rick has been a a big help for me over the years. Um, he reviewed the entomology for my first book, fly patterns for still water. So when I did the entomology section for my new book, it was only natural to get Rick's input. Um, and I'm, I like bugs and entomology. It's one of the attractions to this sport and for me. And, uh, so Rick and I often, I'll get way into the weeds on really like, hemolit blood and oxygen you know all this stuff that the average fly fisher doesn't really need to know <laughs> but um you know we have some great discussions and uh you know I've, I've spent some time with him fishing on rivers like the deschutes and, and the mm-hmm. missouri where we're like a couple of kids at christmas we're saning the river and looking at bugs i remember fishing we were fishing with dave hughes and dave's looking back at us like what are those two up to he's <laughs> fishing and we're sort of sitting on the bank and we've sampled a riffle and look at that look at that look right at he's probably thinking you guys are nuts you're missing out some good fish in here that's right <laughs> that's we're looking right at bugs. but rick is a wealth of, of knowledge on entomology and and he is that he's got a master's degree in in entomology he's yep. a retired bio um entomologist as you know with the st- yeah. former, with the state of oregon and a fly fisher which to me is a pretty good combination yeah yeah he knows his stuff he's yeah. uh i'm gonna hopefully get him back i didn't realize he was as much into the still so he he would be a good person to just dig in like you're saying yeah he he admits you know he he doesn't fish lakes nearly as much as he fishes rivers but he certainly knows about the food sources that are in them uh you know and and you know mayflies for example are common to both types of water uh caddis are uh, midges or coronamids are um so there's even and of course terrestrials are terrestrials um you know there is um you know lots of crossover there or enough that goes okay that that would that logic that would also hold true um in lakes in lakes too yeah. yeah and sometimes even i just think i mean a lot of times you'll have a actual creek flowing into oh, yeah. the, the lake i mean is that something where you uh, you know you could be fishing potentially the creeks as well or is that oh absolutely yeah. especially in the summer months you know, if you look at lakes like Hebgen Lake in Montana, that the, uh, the you know the I think South Fork of the Madison comes in the Madison mm-hmm. Arm, any of those inflow streams from you know big water like that to the you know a little trickle you can jump across is going to bring in cool oxygenated water. Again, fish attracted to current; they need that oxygen in the warmer months, um, and it's going to bring in food. So you can have uh, lakes um, like uh, Hebgen that you know people are fishing trichos or PMDs. Um, and that's not an insect associated with living in lakes. Those are a river. In, but, of course, they're hatching in those lower reaches and drifting out into the lake where, you know, still water trout are only too happy to, to chew on them. You know, it's uh, I've seen stoneflies on lakes. You know, they'll fly and get lost and or the wind carries them. Or, they, again, they've hatched in a stream and have got themselves out into the lake. And, and trout, they're not sitting underneath the water with a, one of Rick's books going, wait a minute, that's <laughs> golden stone. You're not supposed to be here. They just look at that and go, wow, look at that hamburger. I'm going for that. Right. right? So you will see some of those uh, in those situations. You will see, you know, that, that little stream or river coming in is a little conveyor belt of food and oxygen. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. Well, I think we've dug into it here pretty well, uh, Phil. This has been another, you know, awesome uh, episode. Before uh, we get out of here, I was just curious, um, you know, in the next, you know, you, right now we're kind of, uh, we're kind of getting ready for the end of the giveaway, but the mm-hmm. trip won't be until mid-June. What, what's your life look like as far as, I know you got a show coming up. What, what do you got going the next couple of months? Well, I'm uh, be at the Wasatch uh, Fly Fishing Expo um, in the um, 7th, 8th, and 9th. I'm doing some still water, uh, an all-day still water workshop on the 7th, and then a couple of coronamid clinics on the 8th and 9th. I'm also going to sneak out and get on the water. That's what I'm really looking forward oh, to. Oh, nice. I'm going to get on the Provo and do a little Euro nymphing, and uh, uh-huh. I'm going to go out and hopefully, if the ice is off, just do some early uh, ice off fishing on some of the, one or two of the local lakes. We'll see how that goes. And then the next trip for me is the Marlboro Fly Fishing Show in Boston. Um, that was, re- it was supposed to happen in January, but with the whole COVID thing and Omicron, it got rescheduled. Um, so I'll be there um, sort of uh, letting people know in the east that there's some good still water opportunities that they can take advantage of. And then May, I'm doing some filming and some guiding and stuff. And then June um, starts off for me, a busy June 
Um, I'll be uh, in eastern Canada at Canuck Wilderness doing a Stillwater school there. Um, both a beginner, it's kind of a Stillwater 101 and a more advanced uh, course. And then I come back. I think I'm home for a week, and then I get to uh, to see you up at Skitchin. That's right. Uh, we'll be there for a week. That'll be a lot of fun. Again, fishing for those um, wild native fish in a beautiful mm -hmm. in a beautiful locations. You know, when you pull into Skitchin and see that lodge and go, "Wow, I didn't expect that here." Yeah. Right? You have to take an ATV in. You park in the parking lot, and an ATV takes you in the final um, mile or so down this bumpy goat trail. <laughs> nice. They used to use horses years ago to get. Oh you. wow. So when you get there, you're like, whoa, didn't expect this place. It's like, uh, you know, a five-star hotel is. Right oh, there. wow. And then a lake right there and lots of other satellite lakes you can get to. So I'll be there for a week. And then I come out and then I'm around for a day. And then I go to Corbett Lake Lodge where I'm doing a Stillwater school with Brian Chan. Unfortunately, mm. that's all sold out. Um, mm -hmm. And then I come out of there and I go to Stony Lake Lodge. Um, just up the road um, and do a school there that I'm working with a, a fly shop out of Calgary. Um, and that one, unfortunately, is filled up. Filled up. Mm -hmm. And then that's my June. I think July I get to rest and recover a little bit. And then uh, in the fall months back to, to more schools. Uh, Brian and I are doing another Stillwater school at Corbett Lake Lodge. I think we have a couple of spots left for that. So uh -huh. if anybody's interested in that, they can visit my website, flycraftangling.com, and go to the um, – travel and school section down okay. the left margin and there'll be information about those trips and then at the end of the season once we're done i'm going back to argentina oh wow uh, with a full group down there to chase uh, large rainbows on jurassic lake be my fourth there you go my fourth time down there and then christmas and it all starts again with shows so. that's right so yeah. you, you're you're you, you're traveling i mean you're you're uh, sounds like you're away from home more than you're at home yeah, I joke it's more like the Fly Fishing Witness Protection Program. I'm never in the same place twice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sounds, sounds pretty yep. amazing. You, you're uh, definitely kind of living the dream. I think a lot of people would love to do a lot more traveling yep. and fishing. There is some benefits, but as, as you can attest, running a podcast there's there's a business yeah. side of it that uh, can bog you down at times but uh, yep. you know experiences like I've just talked about make it all worthwhile yeah exactly you gotta you gotta embrace the uh, well embrace the suck sometimes right yeah what, exactly. <laughs> I like that term like, that came from uh, that came a t-shirt about that well I'd be taking it from I'm trying to think we had an episode up at the Midwest um, I'll put a link in the show notes to that but we were talking about uh, we were basically saying, "Hey, what, how do you deal with you know? Because Midwest is great, but how do you deal with the winners?" And yeah. and and my guest was like, "Well, you got to embrace the suck, yeah, that's... and also leave, and also go south." <laughs> well, exactly. I'm in the same kind of climate, you know. Basically, from November first to middle of April, um, like right now, we're we're in this transitional stage where it's beautiful and warm and then it snows the next day and it's like mother old man winter will not let go so yeah you got to embrace the suck so for <laughs> me it's either travel south to warmer climes or you get into the show circuit right and sort of take your pent-up enthusiasm your cabin fever and and ex ex express right. it through seminars and talking to other crazy fly fishers that are in the same yep. embrace the suck mode that's amazing that's <laughs> yeah you're amazing. lucky on the west coast where you are you just have to embrace the rain right well, and that can be pretty rough too at yep. times. Sometimes actually it can be rough because it's it's not just the cold, it's the dark and yes. no sun. Which, well, which I can, lived, yeah, I yeah. lived on the West Coast for, for many years and yeah, we didn't, you know, if snow happened, <laughs> you had to call in the, you know, National mm -hmm. Guard sometimes. Right? Oh, yeah. Nobody knew how to deal with snow, but, you know, just the monsoon rain. 100 rains, inches, 100, 100 inches of inches rain. In, in two hours, it seemed sometimes. And like you said, that doom and gloom, right? It was always overcast and yep. it just, at times worked on people's moods and stuff, right? Oh, but, yeah. You know, there's pros and cons to every every place on the planet, which is probably good. That's why we all don't live in the same 200 square mile. Yeah. No, I, I, and I don't know if this is, there's truth, how much truth there is to this, but the thing I always hear about is the suicide rate in like Alaska is number one, yeah. Oregon, Washington, you know, like the Western, like Northwest, like yeah. very high. And that's because of the seasonal depression and all that stuff. Yep. It's I kind can, of crazy. Yeah. We, you know, people that we still got lots of friends on the West coast and like, God, how can you live in, in, you know, where it gets to minus 40 centigrade, which is about where Fahrenheit and Celsius meet. It's just, that's just cold. But the one thing, obviously we're not running, like when it's pouring rain on the West coast, you're not running around outside and no. 
or are we running around in shorts and flip-flops and that kind of cold? But it's usually beautiful and sunny. Right. So you have this beautiful sun. You're wearing sunglasses when you go for a drive, which seems kind of weird, paradoxical, I think that's a word. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a paradox. paradox. Um, we're sunglasses in minus 40. So, uh, yeah, Gosh. it's just something you got to experience. It's fun to go outside with a kettle of water and throw it in the air and watch it turn to snow instantly. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, one of those uh, sort of uh, grade Scientific. school science tricks. Yeah. Everybody does it. Oh, let's go try this. Wow. Well, and then wow. run back inside. Yeah, our poor <laughs> Labrador goes for a pee in about 0.8 seconds on those. That's days. right. Yeah, your nose hairs are freezing up, right? <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, that's that's my definition of cold. You know, when it's we have a drier cold. So in in the you know when it's just slightly below zero, like you know 32, 28, 25, somewhere in there. Um, you know, you're still dry. You just got a fleece top on and a you know a baseball hat and you're fine but when those nose hairs freeze mm-hmm. and the wind it's the wind too is when that winds up it's like somebody slapping you in the face and yeah. that that's that that's if it's a light wind day it's it sun's out it's it's you know it's, it's not lying on the beach kind of weather no. but it's, it's manageable <laughs> where are you where are you at now in the, where, where's your home i live in sherwood park which is a little um bedroom community i guess you could say just slightly is east of edmonton alberta so we're about six hours north of the uh canada u.s border okay alberta yeah, yeah that's right yeah, you're yeah. right. that's perfect yeah nice phil well this has been awesome and another good i uh, love that we dug into the dry flies a little bit and uh, i'm excited to definitely get up there and fish yeah. with you in person for the first time and definitely if anybody is listening and they want to attend or meet up with me and you and everybody else up there we've got this um we got this giveaway going on, and then we've also got some other trips that may be or may not be open by the time this goes. Yeah. Well, they should they should be open. There should be some we slots. Hope they are, but it'd be great to it'll be great to see you, Dave, and of course any of your listeners that want to join us. It'd be great to see them too, and and uh, introduce them to still waters and the magic that they offer. And I just love fishing them so much. Perfect. All right, Phil, flightcraftangling.com, and, uh, yep. and until we see you uh, on the lake, uh, have a good time on your travels. Yeah, enjoy the show. Let me know about anything new that I need to get. I will. I'll, I'll, send, you, I'll send you a text later today. Perfect. <laughs> All right. See you, Phil. Take care. So there you go. If you want to find the show notes and get the links, everything else we talked about today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash bonus fill. That's wetflyswing.com slash bonus fill. If you haven't checked it out right now, this is your chance. Show notes. We'll have a link down there for the giveaway couple more days going on here and we're going to be giving this one away you can head over to uh, skachin uh, lodge check them out or you can just go to wetflyswing.com slash giveaway wetflyswing.com slash giveaway and that'll direct you right over to the page where you can sign up you can uh, just enter your email you can easily click over you can share to get some bonus entries lots of stuff over there on the page and hope to see you on the river and on the lake. I'm going to be there on the lake uh, on this trip when we do it. So if you want to come fishing with me on the lake, on the Stillwater, learn from one of the best in the game at an amazing lodge, then you're going to want to check this one out right now. As always, I appreciate you. I appreciate your support on the show and any shares that you've been able to put together. And uh, just, it's amazing. I had a good conversation recently with uh, with Dave Jackson. Dave Jackson, we were talking about how uh, we can make the show better. So if you have any way, any ideas, any ways, anything that come to mind, how we can make the show better for you or have an idea for a guest, please reach out to me, Dave at wetflyswing.com. I'd love to hear from you or just say hi. Let me know. Are you hitting some still water this year? Are you more a still water? Are you more a still water person? Are you more river stream flowing waters what's your what is it what what's your jam for me i've always been kind of more rivers although i feel like maybe i'm a still water i'd like to be equal um there's something about if you haven't been out there on the lake uh recently you should definitely put it together anyways i'm gonna let you get out of here uh, appreciate it talk to you soon Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.